Okay, this is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. And we're going to look at the subject of who is a good man to follow. So, chapter 4, verse 1 says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The us has to refer to Paul and Apollos and Cephas. That is, if you look back at chapter 3 and verse 22, it's those three men. And if you are a steward, then you are to preach and teach the gospel and the words of God, specifically here, the mysteries. And there are some great mysteries in the Bible. For example, the greatest one is in 1 Timothy 3.16 which says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. So this mystery has to do with Jesus Christ being God manifested in the flesh. And then other mysteries, like in Romans 11.25, talks about the mystery of the blindness of Israel. 1 Corinthians 15.51 talks about the mystery concerning our vile bodies being changed at the rapture. Ephesians 5.32 shows us the mystery of Christ in the church. Colossians 1.27 shows us the mystery about the indwelling Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 shows us the mystery of iniquity. Revelation 17.5 shows us mystery Babylon. And a faithful steward will try his best to familiarize people with these mysteries as much as possible. And when a church has false doctrine, it is because they aren't faithful stewards of these mysteries or they've got the mysteries wrong. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So it is a requirement to be found faithful. So a good man to follow is a man that has already been found faithful. In Luke 16, 10 through 12, it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So a good man to follow is a man that isn't concerned with what man thinks. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of, an, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. So he said it is a small thing to be judged of them. He isn't worried too much about what they have to say about him. He's worried about pleasing the Lord. And in Acts 5.29 it says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So it's about pleasing the Lord. It's about obeying God over men. And Paul says in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 4, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. So Paul truly doesn't know if he is faithful. We don't truly know if we are faithful. Most of us probably aren't doing a good of a job as we think we are. We're not doing as good of a job as we think that we're doing. But the best thing to do is do what you know to be right and abstain from doing what you know is wrong. But a good man to follow will be someone who you can find faithful. At least as far as your eyes can see, a good man to follow will talk about the coming of the Lord and the rapture. And at the second coming, in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. So every man who is faithful will have praise of God. He will say to them, Well done, my good and faithful servant. And every man will have praise of God in the sense that every man will praise God eventually. In Philippians 2.11, it says, And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody one day, no matter who they are, Christian or non-Christian, is going to give God praise face to face. 1 Corinthians 4.5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then 
shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So Paul is saying, judge nothing before the time. Many times we look at other Christians and compare them among other Christians. We may say this certain preacher will have the most rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, but that's foolish because Paul said, Judge nothing before the time. Proverbs 18.13 said, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So Paul said the Lord is going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, hearts. So the Lord knows the motive of every Christian. He knows what every Christian is doing in secret. He can read the heart. You can't do any of these things. You may see a Christian who is in the spotlight doing all these great things. He may be doing all these things for himself, though. And you might end up getting more rewards than him at the judgment seat. It says in Matthew 6, 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So, you may have all kinds of people that you don't even know is doing that much for the Lord, yet they're in their closet praying. They're constantly reading their Bible, studying the Bible, memorizing the Bible. Maybe even going out winning souls to Jesus Christ and you don't even know about it. They could get just as much rewards as these celebrity Christians who are always in the spotlight. And when Paul says, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, notice that word figure. The figure is like what he showed us in chapter 3 when he says, I have planted and Apollos watered. Paul isn't a farmer, but he's giving you a figure. He's calling himself a planter, showing you that he is a steward. He's just a minister. And you shouldn't think of him any higher than anyone else. He is judged of no man in that sense. Second Corinthians 10.12 says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So you're better off not to compare yourself to other Christians. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ and try to follow his example as close as you possibly can. And then you'll be found faithful. Then you'll be a good man to follow. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So a good man to follow won't exalt man. Paul doesn't exalt man. Uh, Galatians 6.3 says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So no matter how many good things a man is doing, he's still a man. And Psalms 39.5 says, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. So every man at his best state is nothing compared to God. Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Now, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, For who maketh thee to differ from one another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Paul says, Who maketh thee to differ from one another? Obviously, the Lord did. He wants us to be individuals, not clones and copies of each other. And when you realize men are different, you'll be a lot happier. When you realize people aren't just like you and accept them for what they are as your fellow Christians, you'll be a lot less disappointed because some people have strengths that others don't have. Some people have weaknesses others don't have. God has something different that he wants each of us to do. So verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from one another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? So it is good that God made you different. It is him that gave you strength that he didn't give another Christian. He gave you a weakness that he didn't give another Christian. It is him that gave you everything you have. 
because it says, And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? So why are you acting like you accomplished anything on your own or gained anything on your own, any reward or anything like that that you've gotten? He's the one that caused you to receive it. So why are you acting as if you got it on your own? All the Bible you know you learned from someone else or from your own personal studies where the Holy Spirit showed it to you directly. Your mind and your eyes had to be opened for you to learn anything that you've learned about the Bible. So it's all from God. 1 Corinthians 4, 8, Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. So they think they are full, they think they are rich, Paul is being sarcastic here, but these Corinthians, they're like the Laodiceans in Revelation 3.17, which says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So they think they are reigning as kings, but this won't take place until the millennial reign, which is after the tribulation and the second coming, and even then, if they stay babies in Christ, they won't have much rain but Paul seems to be being a bit sarcastic and a good man to follow is someone who doesn't care to hurt someone's feelings when necessary and Paul obviously doesn't first Corinthians 4 9 says for I think that God has set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. So Paul is an apostle. And when he says, as it were appointed to death, he's referring to the fact that the apostles were always in danger of death. And if you look at 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 28, look at what Paul says here. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. And labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent. And deaths oft of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So you see, Paul was in danger of death daily. And that's why he says, As it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. What Paul was going through was like a, a a movie, something you'd see in a movie, and even the he was made a spectacle to the angels, even. And he goes on to say in verse ten, "We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised." Paul is was made a fool for Christ's sake. Not for his own sake. He wasn't doing all these things to get credit for the world. He was trying to get as close to God as he possibly could. Do as much as what God wanted him to do as he possibly could. Once again, Paul seems to be using sarcasm. Because to make the Corinthians realize they aren't all that great. He's saying, me and the apostles ain't too good here. He says, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable. But we are despised. He's saying, we are weak. But ye are wise in Christ. You know, he's saying, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ to the Corinthians. Because, you know, they think they're so good, so he's using sarcasm here. He's saying, me and the apostles, we're not too good, but y'all are great. He's trying to make them realize just how puffed up they are. Now, verse 11, even unto this present hour... We both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. So, as an apostle, Paul has been through some things. He would have some stories to tell. As it says about Moses in Hebrews 11.25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's how Paul was. Paul had been caught up 
to the third heaven. He's seen things that the Lord told him not to tell anybody about, so he knew what was waiting for him on the other side. So this, along with the fact that he didn't have a wife or a family, it led him to go all out for God and not even worry about his life. And he says in Philippians 1.23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he had a desire to go ahead and be with the Lord, but he knew some people needed him down here. And that's a good person to follow with that attitude. On his journey down here, he went through times of hunger and thirst and had no certain dwelling place, as the verse said. His occupation was tent making and probably had to make his own roof over his head many times. And he said there in verse 12 that he worked with his hands. Paul is all about working with your hands. And that's a good person to follow, someone that will work, someone that's on time for work, someone that doesn't miss work over every little thing. And he says in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. So Paul is a worker. He labors in the word and doctrine, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.13 says, Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world, and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. So even though people defamed him, they slandered and spread lies about him. He still entreated, that is, he prayed for them. And that's a good man to follow, someone who loves man so much that he prays for his enemies. He's made as the filth of the world because the world loves to call evil good and good evil. So the apostle Paul was made as the filth of the world in the eyes of many men that put darkness before. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. So they would say Paul is wicked, but someone like Taylor Swift is just great. Or someone like Ariana Grande or Travis Scott or any of these other wicked people that they worship. Or whoever they're worshiping now. That is actually the filth of the world. The drag queen story hour stuff, that's the filth of the world. That's not something good and great as the world portrays it as. That is actually filth, but Bible-believing Christianity is seen as the filth of the world. Paul calls himself the offscouring of the world. He was refused, despised. People loved to hate him. In Lamentations three forty-five and 46, it says, Thou hast made us as the offscouring and refuse in the midst of the people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. So just like the Apostle Paul was spoken of by the world, they spoke against him. Uh, a true Bible-believing Christian, if he says what he really believes, the world's going to speak against him too, and that's a good person to follow. And the Corinthians were so worldly that Paul had become this way in their eyes. Imagine a rough preacher like Danny Castle or Donnie Dalton or Ruckman or someone like that getting up at a T.D. Jakes church or a Joel Osteen's church this Sunday and preaching. That's probably what it was like when Paul preached to the Corinthians. Something like that. It was not like when Kanye West got up there and preached at Joel Osteen's church. It would be like one of these rough guys out there getting up and preaching at Perry Stone's church or as one of these rich mega churches, Rick Warren type churches. Imagine that. Imagine if they got up there. Imagine if someone like Stephen Anderson got up and preached at T.D. Jake's church. Imagine the outcome of that, what the people in the crowd would be saying. You have someone rough that's preaching the word of God, preaching against sin, hard against sin, get up there and imagine the look on people's faces. They're going to say this guy is full of hate and all this stuff. Now, 1 Corinthians 4.14, it says, I, run, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. So Paul got a little rough, but he spake the truth in love, and he's not trying to just shame them or something. In Galatians 4.16, he says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Many times... 
a good man to follow is going to seem like your enemy. But he's just trying to make you better. And he says, as my beloved sons, I warn you. One of the best friends you can have is someone that will warn you. In Acts 20, 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, he says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. So warning someone is loving someone. They are his beloved sons, as he calls them. And this is because he himself won them to the Lord. And although he didn't want a spiritual title like father, he was in a sense their spiritual father because he won them to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4.15 says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Even though they had a bunch of big shot instructors leading them the wrong way, it seems Paul is the one who gave them the gospel. He is the one that told them about the death, burial, and resurrection and how we are saved by grace through faith without works. And he says in verse 16, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Don't just follow anybody. Don't just go to any church. Follow the right man. Hang around the right people. Make sure they are King James Bible believers. Make sure they are separated from the world. That's who you want to follow. 1 Corinthians 4.17 For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So Timothy is another beloved son, someone Paul trusted, someone he knew that was faithful and would give it to the Corinthians straight and hard and rough, like a real preacher should, not just, you know, being soft and not trying to offend people or make people upset, but giving it straight to people. Paul is going to use him to remind the Corinthians what living a crucified life is, what sound doctrine is, what the Word of God is, and what separation is. He's just going to give them what Paul teaches everywhere in every church, and there is more than one local assembly of believers called churches, but there is also only one body, only one, the church, which is made up of every born-again believer. So Paul went around to every local church, giving them straight-up Bible teaching. He didn't go to a church and use an ESV over here and sing their rock music just because that's how they do it. But he, every church he went to, he would use the Word of God, and he wasn't different at this church than he was at this church. You know, he, he, he kept things straight. And these are preachers... There's preachers today that, you know, they'll go to this church and they'll use a new King James. They'll go to this church and they'll use the King James. And if you look them up on YouTube, it's like, you know, what are you doing? You, you're going to this church and you're a King James Bible believer. You go to this church and you're using the new King James. That doesn't make any sense. It's like you're trying to, uh, you're deceiving the King James Bible believers, making them think you actually believe the Bible. And then you go to this other church over here and you're making them think that you're going along with their worldliness, their rock music, and their new Bibles. And there are preachers that actually do that. But at a Bible church, there will be King James only. And not just King James only, but King James Bible believers because there's a difference there. You can be King James only and not actually believe it. That's just your preferred one. But if you're a King James Bible believer, you believe every word is perfect. You don't try to change it. You, and you adjust your beliefs to fit what the Bible says. But at the worldly church, they'll ditch the Bible and use the ESV or a NKJV and sing along with the rock music. But Paul wouldn't do that if he was here today. And a good man to follow will not do that. Now he says in verse 18, Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. So they were like, Paul ain't going to come back here and mess with us. They thought they were. They thought they knew more than Paul. But no matter how much you learn, you still have less experience than someone who has been at it much longer. Even if you surpass someone in Bible knowledge, if they've been at it a lot longer, 
you still can learn from them because of their experience. They got way more experience. 1 Corinthians 4.19 says, But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will and will know, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. So notice Paul says, if the Lord will. Always keep in mind that you don't have a clue what is going to happen tomorrow. James 4.14-15 4, through 15 says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So it's always Lord willing, we'll do this tomorrow or next week. You always want to say that. 1 Corinthians 4.19 But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will. And we'll know, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. So he won't know the speech of them when he gets there because they won't say what is really on their heart to his face. But he will know their power. Their power has to do with if they're preaching Christ crucified because that's the power of God. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now verse 20 For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. So the power is in the gospel, and you get in the kingdom of God by trusting in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection to be your payment for sin. It's only through his shed blood that it's possible for you to get into the kingdom of God. Now verse 21, What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? He's going to come with, to them with a rod or in love or in the spirit of meekness, depending on how they accept this message that you just read here in chapter 4. But this has been verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 4.